guys look at my pimple it's so gross it's like a planet on my face it's forming yeah that's kind of nasty seriously this is body sculpting a combination of liposuction and fat transfer do you feel dopey already not yet all botulinum toxin does is it chemically disconnects the nerve from the muscle. So any muscle animation, a frown, a grimace, a facial shape that you create with the muscle which is inappropriate or which um, lends a character to your face which you dislike can be attenuated with the use of botulinum toxin. So we're just trying to treat, as I was explaining before, we always try to go big to small. So we're trying to always find the, the, the vein that's most responsible. In this case, I think this vein is probably the one. So I'll just try to go in there. Pinch there. A recent publication revealed that body self-image and confidence amongst women is declining. Eight out of ten women and girls participating in a global beauty and confidence survey admitted to having cancelled an important activity simply because of how they look. Now there may be several reasons why some people might not be too happy with their looks. For example, a young girl might be traumatized by acne or some other disfiguring skin condition. Some middle-aged lady might not be too happy to accept the fact that she's getting wrinkles on her face. A young woman might not be confident enough to wear a swimsuit in public either because of some spider veins or too much cellulite in some other places. Now aesthetic medicine is said to be fast growing in South Africa and is largely driven by women. Now people unhappy with their appearance have more options today than 20 or 30 years ago. So today we discuss aesthetic medicine. We have aesthetic medical doctors and a specialist surgeon and vein expert to look at acne and common skin conditions affecting the face, some common facial treatments, varicose and spider veins, weight loss and body sculpting. Our guest will enlighten us on indications, safety, efficacy and cost of these procedures. So sit back, relax and learn from this exciting show ahead. Your questions and views are always welcome and the telephone to reach us at is Johannesburg 714-6841-6842 or 6843. You can also tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply interact with us, with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. I'm Dr. Selim Daoum and this is Health Talk. All botulinum toxin does is it chemically disconnects the nerve from the muscle. So any muscle animation, a frown, a grimace, a facial shape that you create with the muscle which is inappropriate or which um, lends a character to your face which you dislike can be attenuated with the use of botulinum toxin. So we can block the signal getting through from the nerve to the muscle so that that frown that you create without thinking about it is now eliminated. I'm here to see Dr. Tugut and I would like some Botox on my surprise night and maybe some sides here. start seeing the changes within four days of your treatment and those changes will progress and mature up to roughly 14 days. The result that you have at two weeks should be the result you maintain for the ensuing four months. Okay, now here to tell us a lot more about, you know, aesthetic medicine or all these Botox injections and fillers and all of that is uh, our special guest and uh, this is Dr. Anushka Reddy. 
Dr. Reddy is president of the South African Association of Cosmetic Doctors, and she's owner of MediSculpt based in Johannesburg. Welcome, mm -hmm. welcome to Health Talk once again. Thank you, Dr. Sela. It's lovely being here this morning. All right. Now, just, just take us through. You, you're president of the South African Association of Cosmetic Doctors. What is this association? So it's a non-profit organization. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in South Africa, aesthetic medicine is unregulated by our controlling body, which is the Health Professions Council of South Africa. So whatever we do in this field of medicine, which is still very much a new field in South Africa, mm -hmm. um, it needs to be peer reviewed and controlled by the doctors who are practicing this form of medicine. Mm -hmm. So that was the whole aim of the society, yeah. is to create a body that could sort of help doctors and guide them as to you know, to practice in an ethical manner and um, of obviously patients the best benefits. Okay. Mm. So, 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 but it's only for doctors and it doesn't include yeah. all other. I mean, there's all sorts of places, beauty uh -huh. salons and yeah. all of these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So those fall outside your, your association. Absolutely, absolutely. So, as you know, a product like Botox, it's a Schedule 4 drug, only it's supposed to be, it's meant to be administered by doctors. And um, uh, unfortunately, you know, it's happening all over the world is that these type of procedures are now being offered by non-medical professionals and we're trying to curb that because there's a lot of complications that can arise because of these uh, procedures and in the, in the wrong hands you know mm. you can end up with an episode of botched yeah. on our shores yeah but who polices this now so is it, it's supposed to be the Health Professions Council of South Africa uh, who's meant to do this but as you know their hands are tied up they've got mm. more pressing issues to attend to mm. so we need to take control of this and make sure that our doctors practice in a manner that's befitting uh, to the profession mm. and uh, that upholds the profession, you know, in, in a certain way. All right. Well, let's start with, with Botox then, because this is the, mm -hmm. the well-known one yes. that everybody yes. talks about. What is Botox and who, who well, needs it? So, so Botox, you know, from medical school, if you do remember, it, it's a botulinum toxin. Yeah. It's a purified protein. So it's not rat poison as we read in You Magazine and People's Magazine. And it's a scheduled drug. Mm. So it's been around in medicine for over 60 years. It's been used in aesthetic medicine for the last 25 to 30 years. Mm. It's completely regulated and controlled in South Africa by the Medicine mm. Control Council. Mm. And it's used mainly to... Um, stop wrinkles, it stops dynamic wrinkles. So we inject it, for example, between your eyebrows and it stops you from frowning mm -hmm. around the eyes and it stops, uh, you know, the crow's feet from forming. So, so it's basically right for doses. people who, who can't accept the fact that they're getting a little older. Then. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> far from it, far from it. Mm. You know, we all want to, we, people are living longer. We're working uh, much longer. We're working way past the so-called retirement age. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're feeling great about yourself. You know, yeah. you're 60, you're looking great, feeling great. When you look in the mirror, yeah. you also want to look great. So, mm. so that's where these procedures come in. So it's little touch-ups okay. that we so, offer. So, so mainly for wrinkles and, and sorts out these, these, these frowns. And, and, and how is it normally given then? Um, so it's, it's an injection. Yeah. Um, it's not painful. Mm -hmm. the, the needles used are quite um, fine. So mm -hmm. it's three or four injections per area. It depends which area is being injected. And um, it usually takes seven to ten days to take effect. So it's not an immediate result. And it lasts for three to four months. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll notice so, so that basically... lasts for three to four months? Yes. And then you'll notice that maybe, for example, your frown, if that's what's been uh, treated, yeah. you'll notice that your frown is slowly coming back. So your face does not fall. It does not drop. I've been asked that question ah, okay. a million times. Yeah. Nothing of the sort. It reverts to its original state. So, so it's not a permanent solution, is it? No, unfortunately not. All it's right. not. It's, uh, you know, fillers tend to last a bit longer, which yeah. I'm sure we'll talk about just now. Yeah. But Botox, usually it's three to four months. Uh, quickly cost? Uh, so it depends on the area, but you can pay anything between 60 to 70 rand per unit. Yeah. And you can use anything from 10 units to 40 units on a face. So you can... One treatment uh, consultation, you can, you know, so you can, can set you off, what, about a thousand rands? About a thousand. Or, yeah? About a thousand as okay. a minimum cost, yes. Yeah. And you'd need about three, four of those? Uh, per year. Per year. Per year. Okay. You'd need every three to four months, yes. All right. Talk about fillers then. What, right. what are those? So yeah? fillers are a completely different product. Um, um, it's got nothing to do with Botox. Uh, fillers do not have the chemical effects of Botox. So Botox relaxes muscles, mm. whereas uh, fillers, we use it more as it has a mechanical effect. So it's used to plump up areas. That's mm. basically what we would... And, and what are those common areas then that people... So typically areas would be these, what we call these tear troughs below the eyes, nasolabial mm. folds. Mm. We use it to augment lips. Mm. Kendall Jenner actually put fillers on the map. Uh, for young people a few years ago, right. I mean a year ago, and we use it to augment cheeks. So 
and, and, and those are just a few of the areas I've mentioned. We, there's so many other applications yeah. that we do use for Do they cost well. about the same as, as the bottles? No, no. So, so it's right. a totally different cost. So it depends. Different practices choose different amounts, so uh, uh, charge different amounts. So in my practice, I would charge per syringe. So you'd pay anything between three to 4,000 Rand per syringe. And that's for one syringe. And then depending on the extent of the wrinkles, you would use anything between one to four fillets. It's quite a lot of money to put with. And, and, and yes. how, how long do, do these ones last now? So fillets, if, the, the ones that I have in my practice are FDA approved to last 12 months. Mm. Some fillers, the longer lasting fillers can go up to two years. Mm. So oftentimes, it may be oftentimes we see this so-called botched procedures yes. and uh, you know, people end, ending up with disfigured faces and mm -hmm. so on. Are there any complications to these things? Oh, absolutely. Uh, right. and, and that's where the society comes in. So we have training meetings, especially with fillers. I mean, uh, we, we can run into major problems, permanent sequelae, uh, complications that can happen with fillers. Mm -hmm. In the East, for example, the number of cases of blindness have increased from five a few years to, ago to just over 30 now. So injecting, for example, an easy area like the nasolabial fold, tip of the nose, or even between the eyebrows, the glabella with filler, can easily occlude the artery that supplies the retina, that's the back of the eye, mm. and cause blindness. So in the wrong hands, you, you can end up with serious complications. Mm. So, so this is why it's important that you go to an accredited place, yes. a, an accredited doctor that knows what he or she is doing Abs about, you know, about these things. Absolutely. Yeah. I cannot stress that. Yeah. Uh, it's so important. And also, what's becoming a trend in South Africa is uh, doctors visiting beauty salons and hairdressers. Mm. And, you know, I want to emphasize to the public that, those, that it's completely unethical and unprofessional to actually, as a medical person, to offer these medical procedures in such an environment. Mm. And uh, the alarm bell should start ringing the minute you, you have a doctor, uh, you're visiting a beauty salon, and your beauty salon is sending you a message to say, Dr. X is here, mm. you know, with his toolbox offering Botox and fillers. Mm. Uh, because there's no backup. If anything does go wrong, yes. there's no backup. You're in a non-medical environment. Mm. Now, we hear there's something called, what, threads or something. What, what is yeah, that? Yes, so threads are very exciting new development yeah. for the last few years in South Africa. So people, are, you know, with a bit of sagging, so you, you're in your mid-40s, mm. not quite ready for surgery, not entirely happy with the way your jawline looks, it's a bit of, it has a bit of a jolly look. So that's where threads come in. So it's, it's a non-surgical uh, procedure, or I should say minimally invasive procedure. Mm. And we use needles attached to threads insert it under the skin and the skin is basically pulled pulled back and in the right candidate you have almost a surgical like result mm. so it's quite amazing and this is a lunchtime procedure mm. and is this more more, more permanent uh, well it lasts for two years two so years. it's not um it's not it you know it doesn't have the surgical like uh, result for yeah. up to five years but People don't want to have surgery. They don't like the anesthetic. They don't like the cost. They don't like the downtime. Nobody ha can afford two weeks behind closed doors. Mm. So that's why non-invasive um, procedures are becoming so popular. Mm. And of course, there's a whole lot of other options and a whole lot of other procedures that you do. And, and people mm -hmm. more and more demand these you know, face-changing procedures. Yes. Yeah. Provided that they're safe. Eh? Yes, absolutely. Right. But Safety unfortunately, that's all the time we had for. No, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution. You're welcome. I'm enlightened. Okay, good. <laughs> all right, so after the break, we discuss some other common facial skin conditions. Please stay with us. Shield Medical Scheme. We don't just talk health, we do health. At MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health, we do health. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. It's so good, nothing else can replace just your slightest embrace. And if you only would be my own for the rest of my day, I will whisper this phrase, my darling Ceci Bon. MedShield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill, we'll help you stay well.
guys, look at my pimple. It's so gross. It's like a planet on my face. It's forming. Yeah, that's kind of nasty. Seriously? Yeah. Ugh, okay. Wait, what did I say? Oh, there's a new one. Welcome to the family. I'm gonna call you Donald. Uh, have you tried uh, washing your face, though? Of course I wash my face. Yes. I always wash my face. Every every day, though. Not just like every week or something. This else. guy. Yeah. Well, my skin is pretty bad for my skin, so I don't know why I shouldn't hide my skin. I'm just like looking at myself and wondering what people are going to say. Well, I posted a selfie on Instagram. Social anxiety seems to be a result of dealing with acne. Finding it very hard to like look people right in the face. I'm kind of amazed at how many people took no issue with just staring at me. Yeah, if you have something wrong or something funny looking in your face, people will stare at you. Now, let's invite another special guest to enlighten us a lot more on these issues. And this is Dr. Alistair McAlpine, who is head of medical aesthetics at Light Scalp Aesthetic Clinic based in Johannesburg. Welcome to Health Talk. Good morning, sir. Thank you Dr. for having McAlpine. me. Okay. Well, I mean, look, as we saw in that clip, acne can be quite traumatizing for um, young girls, especially. Well, Briefly, let's, let's just talk about acne. I mean, what, what causes acne? So, acne is a very, very common skin condition. Actually, yeah. the WHO in 2013 listed acne as the eighth most common disease worldwide, affecting 660 million people. So, mm. it's a very prevalent condition. Right. Um, common causes of acne are genetics. Mm. Um, can be hormonal as well, so that's why you see it normally in sort of your prepubescent or your pubescent teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, there can be social causes as well, psychological causes from stress, mm -hmm. diet can play a factor as mm -hmm. well, smoking has also been linked to acne, so there are a whole host of causes, and also yeah. multifactorial as well. Right, right, right. So, so I mean, if, if you look at some of those social and other causes, I mean, other than genetic, because you can't do anything about it, um, can you just perhaps point out one or two so, that, so so people at least watching this this program can know what to avoid? So kind of yeah. uh, basically, we live in an environment where we are very stressed. Mm -hmm. We have daily stresses. So right. those stresses can cause hormonal changes, which can then lead to acne formation. Right. Um, also, the environment that we live in, there's right. a lot of pollution around. Mm -hmm. We eat a lot of junk food as well. Mm -hmm. So all those factors come right. into play, which right. basically either if you've had acne that can make oh. it worse or if you've never had acne can develop it. Okay, okay. So, so, so obviously, I mean, there's different grades. You can get mild, you can get, you know, very severe. But, but just simply, I mean, uh, when it comes to treatment, uh, what's your advice, first of all, before people come and see you? Okay. So with any patient that has acne, so make sure that you're first going to a professional who can deal with the problem. So maybe right. starting off at your general practitioner. Most general practitioners can um, manage mild to moderate acne. Mm -hmm. More severe cases, cases should be managed by specialists such as a dermatologist. Right. Right. Um, it's always important rather go and see the GP or see your doctors, come and see us at an aesthetic clinic and we can advise you what treatments are going to work, whether it's mm -hmm. Topical treatments, do you need oral medication? Mm. Um, we can do a whole host of chemical peels. There's various things that we can do, and even combination treatments as well. Mm. But provided that the correct treatment is being provided for the correct case and yeah. that you're seeing the correct practitioner to manage your condition. Yeah. Very often, I mean, you walk down the aisles of, you know, uh, a local supermarket and, uh, you know, these kind of places, you see all sorts of products that are lined up there that. Uh, are said to be treating acne and that's sort of your advice to, to, the, to the public? Well, um, the, a lot of those products, those over-the-counter products that you can buy can be beneficial, but they might not mm. help the patient entirely. Yeah. Hence why it's still important to go and seek medical advice, mm. go and chat to a doctor, chat to a specialist. Right. Maybe you can get the most optimal advice and treatment that's going mm. to give you the best outcome because the big issue with acne is to prevent complications that come with acne later on, mm -hmm. namely scarring yeah. and then pigmentation that's associated with acne. Okay, so how do you treat them then? I mean, because you deal a lot with, with 
with these uh, patients, isn't that so? Yes. So, well, for instance, say, scarring is, so scarring, is quite a big scarring, problem, yeah? I see a lot of patients that come and see me with acne scarring. Yeah. So there's a whole host of treatments that we can use. We can mm. use non-invasive techniques. We use um, radio frequency ablation to try and re-stimulate collagen, break down that old scar tissue to try and help even out the skin. Right. You can even use dermal fillers as well, the correct type of dermal filler. I know Dr. Reddy was chatting about that. Mm -hmm. Used to try and... Um, lift the pitting, break the scar tissue, yeah. um, and then also chemical peels as well can help with that scarring as well, and mm. the pigmentation. Is it? Okay. Mm. Any other, I mean, talk about, I mean, we're obviously talking acne and other common um, sort of skin conditions affecting young women. Uh, what are the other common ones that you deal with? Okay. So a very common skin condition that I see in my practice is hyperpigmentation or mm. post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Mm -hmm. Conditions such as melasma, mm. um, patients that is, if you've covered has had acne or other inflammatory skin conditions have now left patients with uneven skin tone. Mm. Um, these are very, very difficult to treat mm. um, because their pigmentation is normally quite a deep pigmentation. Mm. And a lot of patients are wanting to have a nice, beautiful, clear, even skin. Mm. So but, but maybe before we, t we talk treatment, I mean, what causes some of these uh, conditions? So it can be hormonal changes, yeah. it can be also exposure to the sun. Unfortunately, we do live, well, fortunately rather, we live in a beautiful country where mm. we're exposed to sun all the time. Right. The sun can be our worst enemy. Mm. That photo damage that's um, caused by the UV radiation from the sun mm. can significantly affect our skin mm. and can cause pigmentation, mm. which I say is very, very difficult to treat. Mm. Mm. And, and, and I mean, just talking about, uh, you know, causes, we, we often hear of uh, uh, some other products that people lay their hands on and they, they, they uh, smear these things onto well, the, their faces the, the, and end up with damaged skin. The, so. the biggest thing that I see is, in my practice is patients purchasing illegal skin bleaching creams. Yeah. Um, it's bought in the back street somewhere. Mm. It's normally prescription substances. Some of the substances are banned, such as hydroquinone or monobenzone. Mm. Patients apply the creams for months on end. This damages the skin. With mm. damaging that skin, these patients land up with severe reactive hyperpigmentation, which is very, very difficult to treat. Mm. 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 And what about sunburn? I mean, do, do you often get uh, lots of sunburn? Well, we do get lots of, pa I get lots of patients with sunburn, but oh. prevention is better than cure. Yeah. So we live in a country where we're exposed to the sun. We have a very harsh sun. Mm. So I always advise any patient that comes to see me, sunblock, mm. at least a factor of 50 sunblock mm. is the way forward to protect your skin. Mm. Mm. And, and the, Let's talk a little bit about some of the, you know, um, cancers that affect the skin. Mm. Which ones do you see commonly? So the ones that we see commonly or I see commonly, and I'll immediately refer the, the patient to a specialist surgeon, is malignant melanoma is quite common in this country, mm. basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, but specifically melanoma. Melanomas normally start off, it looks like a mole, and we all know what a mole looks like, or a nevus. Mm. As soon as that area starts to look irregular, it becomes raised, irregular, mm. um, it becomes inverted, the, the edges become inverted. As soon as it starts to look suspicious, that's when patients should start to go and seek medical advice. Even mm. before that, even if you've got a mole that you're just concerned about, rather let a doctor have a look at it, and they can advise you whether or not it looks okay, let's just monitor it for the next couple of months, or they can refer you to the appropriate specialist to have it removed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the, the cancers are, are the more serious ones mm. that often, you know, obviously will, will, will get referred. But let's come back to the other common ones that now you treat uh, especially where there's a bit of disfigurement, you know, of the face and, uh, you know, oftentimes you need to use dermal fillers and mm. all of that. When it comes to cost now, uh, who, <laughs> the magic which question. ones are covered <laughs> by the medical aid, which ones aren't covered, and those that are not covered, what does it sort of cost, average okay. cost? So, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, most procedures in aesthetic medicine are not covered by medical aid. Mm. Um, looking at costing these treatments, you know, a basic chemical peel can start anywhere from about 600, 700 rand per peel. You might need one peel a month for, say, six to eight months. Mm. We have other more complex treatments where we start to use radio frequency ablation. Those treatments can be a lot more expensive. Those can mm. be 3,000 rand per session, and you mm. might need anywhere between six to eight treatments. Mm. Obviously, combination treatments, then it's going to be a little bit more expensive as well. Mm. Um, as I say, hence why I always maintain prevention is better than cure. Okay. So I think it's a good note to live it at. Prevention is better than cure. Yeah. We're going to continue this discussion just mm. where you are. But how can varicose veins and uh, spider veins be treated? Well, that after the break. Please stay with us.
If we are talking health, then let's talk seriously. News today provide news updates giving a wealth of knowledge. Breaking stories and crossing life for you. We follow business developments intensely. Experts and analysts tackle all challenging issues for you. We cover stories locally and abroad to keep you informed. We cover all sporting codes just for you. We are sure to give you weather to be ready for the day. Stay tuned to News Today at 3 p.m. from Monday to Friday on SABC News. MedShield, embracing our members in good health since 1968. At MedShield Medical Scheme, we don't just talk health, we do health. Welcome back. Well, we're talking varicose veins, and these can be quite disfiguring and can be a source of great stress to some young girls or even, you know, uh, 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 women. But before that, let's show you something. So we're just trying to treat, as I was explaining before, we always try to go big to small. So we're trying to always find the, the, the vein that's most responsible. In this case, I think this vein is probably the one. I'll just try to go in there, pinch there, and there we go. That's as simple as that. The results you're going to see uh, days, weeks, months. Laser vein removal uses the cool glad NDAG to remove facial and leg spider veins without pain or downtime. I'm going to use the NDAG laser to cauterize the little blood vessels in the skin. It just feels like a sharp little zap for a split second, but we, we cool the skin before and afterwards, so it's very bearable. Okay, so we usually start at the bottom and work our way up because the lymph normally flows towards the heart. So we just cool the skin first. And then we're going to pulse there. So here to tell us a lot more about these um, varicose veins, spider veins, and all these procedures that, that you just saw is Dr. Johan Blino, or Blichno, as some, some people might say. Now, Dr. Blino is a specialist surgeon and vein expert based in Johannesburg, am I right? I am, yes, uh, as well as in Schlanger and Durban. I actually live down there. I have a base for both worlds. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to Health Talk. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Thank all you right. for having me. Perhaps let's start with, with this, I suppose, straightforward question for you. Um, varicose veins versus spider veins. What are these and is there any difference between the two? Yeah, absolutely. So th there's a marked difference between the two. Um, we often see our patients come in and they themselves don't understand the difference between the two types of veins. The most important thing is just size. So those large, big, tortuous blood vessels that run down your legs, those are varicose veins. They're mm. typically more than three to five millimeters in size. Mm. And then those very thin, fine, thready veins, and they can be a variety of colors, purple, mm. blue, red, and they usually form a, a dense network down your leg. So those are the yes. spider veins. We've got this picture uh, on, on our screen now. These are spider veins. Absolutely, typically. yeah. So yeah. that's a very typical example of uh, a patient with quite severe spider veins. Most of our patients don't have a case that as, is as severe as these. But yes, that's a very typical example of a spider vein patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the treatment for this would be, um, first of all... But maybe before, yes. before we go to treatment, what, what causes these things and who gets them? Yeah, so... so um, your genetic history, unfortunately. So mm. if you have a parent or two parents that are affected by veins, both spider and varicose veins are also stacked up against you. We don't mm. understand really yet how the genetic penetrance works or how exactly you inherit it. Mm. But we do know that patients with a family history of varicose veins are quite likely to develop varicose veins. So there's a genetic component to it. And then in our female patients specifically, there's a definite link to um, the use of exogenous hormones like oral contraceptives or later in life hormone replacement therapy in some patients. 
mm-hmm. we found that that does accelerate the, the development of new spider veins. Mm-hmm. And what about varicose veins? So in varicose veins, very much the same. So there, the genetic history, again, very, very strong factor. Mm-hmm. And then patients can suffer previous trauma. So get hit by a ball or something on the leg or motor vehicle accident, and it can rupture the valves within the vein, mm-hmm. and you end up with, a, with a, an area of varicose veins. And most often than not, we find patients have a combination of the two. They have some varicose veins, and they have some spider veins. Mm-hmm. Okay. Our, our patients that present with spider veins only are mostly women, sort of in their 30s to 50s, mm. and they have spider veins only on the outside part or the lateral part of the thigh. Mm. So and those veins are mostly hormonal in, in origin. Okay, besides the fact that they disfigure it, you know, are there any complications associated with these things, especially varicose veins, yes, or, so or even both? Yes, so the important thing to distinguish there is the, the medical veins, as we call them, and the cosmetic veins. Mm. So spider veins tend to be cosmetic only, mm. unless they stem from a deeper source of vein reflux, which would be a medical cause then. And then most varicose vein patients are medical cause, or medic. Uh, medical caused vein. So in those cases we find when we do an ultrasound um, scan on their legs we find that there are broken valves or leaky valves within the larger veins mm. and they cause an increase in pressure and hence varicose veins and then sometimes some spider veins. Mm. So those really need to be assessed by somebody that's well versed in the care of veins. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a simple case as in the olden days you walk into a cosmetic clinic or into a doctor's office and oh you have veins and we just inject them or we laser them. Mm-hmm. Those patients need to be properly investigated to see what the cause of those veins. There are many horror stories on the internet that, that we see women reporting, oh, they went for this treatment and it's a horrible fail and they suggest, you know, stay away from that. Mm. And that's not really the truth. That patient just wasn't properly investigated in the first instance. Mm. So in, in terms of complications from spider veins, yes, it's a cosmetic disaster. Yeah. So if you want to bear your legs, mm. um, that unfortunately prohibits it un- unless you're a very confident person. Yeah. And then in terms of varicose veins, yes, we grade vein disease from stage zero to six as a classification. And as you progress down that classification, we do start to see complications. Mm. So simple varicose veins can then cause skin conditions like venous eczema, which is a type of eczema that involves the legs. Mm. That's quite resistant to normal therapy mm. unless you treat the underlying vein problem. Mm. And that may, may progress further to very deep staining of the skin, a change in the skin texture, and then the worst complication right at the end is an ulcer, which are those large wounds that we Mm. see at the bottom of the legs in a lot of patients. All right, last question before we start talking treatment now. Do these get worse? So so, so you don't do anything to them? I mean, do they They, they get worse over time? Very slowly over time. So yeah. it's not something that's going to worsen by next month. Mm. But yes, it's slow, a slowly progressive condition. Okay. And even in patients that we do treat, there is a certain degree of recurrence as well. More in the spider veins as opposed to the varicose veins. Maybe let's stay there. Spider veins. How, how then do you treat them? So we've seen in that, uh, the preamble in the video that um, you showed both a patient undergoing sclerotherapy and then a patient undergoing laser. So yeah. basically... Maybe just for the sake of our viewers, what is sclerotherapy? So sclerotherapy is the injection of a chemical known as a sclerosin mm. straight into the vein itself. So it doesn't involve any of the tissue around it. And that sclerosin, it dis- destroys or destructs a very, very fine inner layer of cells within the vein. And that right. vein cannot survive with that layer of cells. The vein right. collapses. It becomes solid. Your body recognizes that. It reabsorbs that venous protein and it disappears over the next few months, generally okay. s- three to six months. Okay. Whereas a laser treatment, the surface laser treatments, it does a similar thing, except it burns the entire skin patch, including the vein. But the light, the laser light, just selects the vein and the blood, or the red blood cells within the vein, uh, more than the tissue around it. So the vein gets burned from the outside, mm-hmm. and it undergoes the same sort of changes until it disappears. Mm-hmm. But there are other risks involved with those type of treatments in terms of laser. Yeah. That's why, as a general rule of thumb, we keep the lasers and the lights for veins above the level of the heart, so in the neck, the decolletage, the face area, and we use sclerotherapy um, for uh, spider veins below the level of the Who heart. Who can treat spider veins? Can a beauty salon treat spider veins using these laser products? Yeah, so it's a complex question. Our laws uh, at the moment in South Africa does allow for that, but it's not advisable. Um, a vein patient is slightly different than your normal cosmetic patient because mm. there are underlying medical issues, medical mm. vein issues in a lot of those patients. So they, they need a proper assessment and not just um, straight off to the treatment room. Mm. So my advice would be to first see somebody, uh, see a vein expert. There are lots of us around yeah. and get your veins assessed and then you look at treatment. Okay. Then varicose veins then, um, how do you treat them? Yeah, so varicose veins, very different um, 
treatment. Uh, yeah. In those cases, most of those cases, when we look at treatment, those patients have underlying valvular reflux. So there's a valve that's broken in the veins. That's a mechanical fault within the vein. So mm. no amount of medication that you're going to use, creams, ointments, pills, tablets, all of the stuff that you buy at the pharmacy is going to do anything to well, the Well, you hear of, of, of you know, stockings for varicose veins, yeah? Yeah, so in, in the latest guidelines that came out in the UK, stockings are reserved for patients where we cannot offer treatment. So if there is some particular reason, and those are very, very few cases, if there's a particular re reason that we cannot offer you a modern treatment for your veins, yes, stockings is better than not doing any. Thing. Mm, mm. So, what about physical activity and yeah, varicose so, veins? So yeah. Physical activity is very important, uh, not just for vein patients, but in general. So, yep. we, we generally advise our patients to walk for 30 to 45 minutes um, a day after their treatment. And a lot of those patients actually find it quite beneficial and they just carry on doing it. Mm. So, uh, for your veins specifically, avoid sitting for prolonged periods and standing in one position. So, mm. we obviously see vein. Um, uh, vein patients come in the, uh, from the occupations where they stand a lot in one positions like teachers or All nurses. Right. I believe that there's, there's, a, there's a question that has just come through and uh, Musa says, I have solar litiginous, how to treat them or cure them please? So that's actually more appropriate for our previous um, guest. Um, but yeah, from a, from a vein point of view, um, I suppose any skin lesion, it needs to first of all be established whether it's a benign or a non-benign So, So lesion. first of all, what is solar litiginous? So it's a, it's a skin condition. Um, it's, it's not a vein-related oh, skin I condition. See. Okay. Um, it, it's a skin condition that we see in, in older patients. It, it's um, ski, uh, uh, sun or solar-related. Um, okay. Now, that, that may, maybe we, we reserve it for, for our next guest because he's coming back to deal yes. with, with this and other issues. Well, Dr. Bredo, that's unfortunately all the time we have for. All right. And thank, and you, thank so you, much. you so much for your enlightening uh, discussion that we had. And then, and, and yeah, we will probably call on you some other time. All right. Thanks, so after the break, we learn then more about body scouting and weight loss. Please stay with us. MedShield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill, we'll help you stay well. Now this is Trends, of course, your one-stop serving of all that's juicy and trending in the world of entertainment and showbiz. My name, of course, is Rafil Wemulov. I'm Dr. Silo Mutaung, and this is Our Talk. A very good morning and welcome to Media Monitor. I'm your host, Alicia Jolly. My name is Dumila Matez. What time is it? It's question time. For your daily dose of current affairs, tune in to the SABC News Channel. Technology is changing the way we live our lives, like how people on the continent use mobile money to pay for many goods. It's good because it has helped me save. And Africans are now developing new online content. Cameroonians would ask us on social media when the game would come out. On Network, we tell you about Africa's technology and social media landscape. That's Network with me, Pumele Lezondi, every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Central African Time. If we are talking health, then let's talk seriously. This is body sculpting, a combination of liposuction and fat transfer. Here you see a relatively slim but podgy, overworked lady who just cannot find the time to gym the excess away. Here are the markings that guide the sculpting process intraoperatively. Compare these results at just six weeks postoperatively. Do you feel dopey already? Not yet. I'm going to go boom just now. What we've done now is we've given local anesthetic into each of the areas where we're going to make a tiny incision into the skin. And through that incision on our naked now, we're going to put the local anesthetic solution into the area that we're going to be there. The others is the camera system.
the screen. <laughs> this is why I can't fit in those black pants. It's you. You're the cause. But this is the cause of why I can't fit into my Kabbali black pants. This is the reason. You understand? This is the reason. And it's all in a bottle, so it could go away. Well, here to tell us a lot more about how that problem can go away and, and all of that, um, uh, we still have uh, Dr. Alistair McAlpine, Head of Medical Aesthetic, Light Scalp Aesthetic Clinic. Welcome back. Thank you, sir. Now, before we, we, we do that, let's just have a look. We have some two uh, tweets here. Uh, Lala says, any tips in getting rid of cellulite on my thighs and treating acne on my daughter's face? Okay. And I th we have another one, I think. We, we, will, we will come back to this. If we could just, you know, let, let's see if we have another one. All right. Okay. We, we, we'll come back to that mm. just now. But, but before we, we get, I mean, there's, there's an issue there around cellular. I think, mm. I think the acne we, we covered. covered. Perhaps, do, do, do you just want to talk about acne in young children? Because it's about acne. Well, on well, once again, it's advising patients or if they've got a young daughter or young son that's yeah. got an acne problem, yeah. seek medical advice. Right. Rather go and see a medical practitioner that right. can advise you exactly what is going to be the best way yeah. to treat your child and then if necessary, refer your child to a specialist. All right. The tweet that I was looking for actually was something about solar litiginous to mm. say, you know, somebody has solar litiginous. Okay. Uh, what is that and how can... So solar litiginous yeah. can be caused by, once again, as the word says, solar. So yeah. it's, it's a reaction to the UV um, light from the sun or UV radiation from the sun that causes an area of hyperpigmentation. Right. That's, once again, you need to assess the area, make sure that it is a benign area. So benign being it's safe, there's not a precancerous lesion. Mm -hmm. And then there's various treatments that you can do. They're normally topical treatments, so it's a combination of creams, chemical peels, and in some cases, cases or cases rather, systemic treatments that can right. help with that. But oh, okay. it needs to be assessed by a medical practitioner. Okay. Back to what we're supposed to discuss then in this segment, mm. you know. Um, we've shown in the clip you know, the issue around body sculpt, lipo, lysis, liposuction and all of that. But let's just come back to basics now. What is the difference between obesity and cellulite? <laughs> okay, so obesity is defined by something called the body mass index. Mm. So that's where you take your weight in kilograms divided by the square of your height in meters and you get a number. Mm. Normal BMI is 18 to 25. 25 to 30 is considered to be overweight, 30 and above is considered to be obese. Mm -hmm. So that's where obesity is quite a problem in terms of uh, comorbid conditions that um, exist with obesity, such as hypertension, sugar diabetes, right. all those conditions. Mm -hmm. Cellulite can occur in a patient that has a normal BMI, but what cellulite is is basically herniation, so the fats on the superficial, the subcutaneous layer of the skin become herniated, mm -hmm. and you get fibrous bands of connective tissue that give it that hail-damaged appearance. Mm -hmm. So they're two completely different, different things. things. Yeah. However, I mean, there's the so-called fat-dependent areas. In other words, you know, in mm -hmm. somebody that's obese, there's certain areas in the body where fat tends to collect, mm -hmm. say, so, so around our... Uh, men would be around, you know, mm. the, the tummy and, and the ladies around the hips and, mm. and, and so on. Just mm. comment, that, you know, on that and, and the difference between that and cellulite as well. Okay, so main areas of fat collection are, as you've mentioned, cellular around the abdomen. Mm. Thighs are a big problem as well. Um, underarm areas, the bra bulge area on the back. Mm. So there's a whole host of areas that can be affected. Cellulite... Yeah is more in areas such as, especially for ladies, they find it on the buttocks, the thighs, the inner thighs. Mm. Um, those are the main areas where you get cellulite. Okay. So, I mean, generally, before we get to now surgical and invasive stuff, mm. you know, general principles in terms of, you know, we all advise to people wanting to lose weight. Okay. So, with losing weight, there's various ways to lose weight. Mm. So, at my practice, I run a medical weight loss program. Mm. However, the medical weight loss program is designed in such a way to help patients facilitate creating a healthy lifestyle. Mm. If you see on social media, everyone promises this magic pill is going to shed the kilograms in weeks. Mm. And some of those pills will work. However, you don't know what's in those pills, mm. if you're a suitable candidate for those pills, because there's a whole host of complications that can arise with that. Mm. 
in terms of causing damage to your metabolism. Mm. So a lot of these diets that are crash diets where patients lose massive amounts of weight within two, three months, mm. as soon as you stop the program, that's when, because now you've burnt out your metabolism, mm. you're basically going to put that weight back on and even more. So you're actually worse off from where you started. So how do you then help your patients in, in, in that medical weight loss? So yeah? it's providing them with the necessary tools. So we give them the tools to try and help them lose weight. So mm. we almost give them a bit of a kickstart, so to say. Mm. So we encourage a healthy diet with exercise, mm. using products just to help patients start to see results. Mm. I've noticed where patients fall short with trying to lose weight if patients don't start seeing results within about a month, two months of mm. just being on a diet and an exercise program, people mm. become very despondent, had enough, don't mm. want to do this anymore, and they go back to their old habits. Yeah. So as soon as we try and facilitate that so that you start seeing results, mm. patients become motivated. When the patient becomes motivated, guess what happens? They're going to stick to that diet. They're going yeah. to stick to that exercise program. Yeah. So you're creating a whole healthier lifestyle. Mm. Lifestyle, I think, is, is, is the issue there. Let's come back to these procedures now. But perhaps before we, we get into the actual procedures, just try and clarify. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of terminology that's used. You hear laser liposuction, liposuction, lipolysis, and, and all of that. Body sculpting, for okay. instance. Yeah? So let's start off with the non-invasive and we're working towards the invasive. So yeah. non-invasive are things such as body sculpting, so that's using non-invasive techniques. There's a lot of machines out there that help basically with sculpting. So, yeah, But what, what is that? I mean, is it so, reducing? So what it does is basically the machine that I use in my practice something, uses something called pulsed electromagnetic frequency, yeah. which basically it helps to melt fat and tighten skin. So it helps patients to lose centimeters. Um, but do they, do they work though? They do work, provided the patient once again changes their lifestyle. Mm. It's all good and well coming for these treatments and the treatments can be quite expensive, but then they go and have 10 McDonald's burgers later on. Mm. The treatment's not going to work. Mm. Um, so that's where, once again, counseling the patient, making sure the patient's sticking to a diet, right. sticking to an exercise program, that's when you see very nice results with those treatments. Okay, and then the invasive ones, liposuction, so, laser li lipo? Liposuction currently, actually in this country, is a very controversial topic right now because mm. the issue with liposuction is, is that liposuction should be done for body contouring, not as a means of weight loss. Mm. A lot of patients are under the impression that I'm going to have liposuction done, they can suck out two, three, four, five kilograms of fat, I'm going to feel so much better about myself and I've lost five kilos like that. Mm. The problem is, is that liposuction should be used actually for body contouring. So mm. where a patient has lost weight, they've been through an exercise program, they've stuck to a diet, they've been on a medical weight loss program, they've now got a few areas of stubborn fat that they just cannot get rid of, mm. that's where liposuction needs to be done. Mm. The other issue with liposuction is that there are a lot of general practitioners now that are doing liposuction as well. Mm. If a patient elects to have a liposuction procedure done, mm. they need to be aware or should find out, is that practitioner registered to do so? Mm. Do they have the necessary training and facility to do so in terms of a sterile theater facility? Um, can they manage possible complications that can arise from liposuction? Well, so, let's talk about those complications quickly. I mean, because okay. it's a surgical so procedure. It is a surgical procedure. Right. So with any surgical procedure, there's complications such as pain, um, bleeding, yeah. there's been reported cases of damage to underlying organs such as the lungs, perforating into colons and stomachs, um, you can get say, infection, yeah. numbness, um, okay, so, bruising, so, swelling, there's a whole host, but hence why it's important to ensure that you go to a practitioner who is accredited. qualified and accredited to do so, because we're mm. seeing more and more cases now mm. where there are practitioners that are doing these procedures that aren't qualified to do so. And the so. cost? Last question. So, depending on where you, where you go to, um, and if it's done under local anesthesia, general anesthesia, anywhere from about 15,000 Rand up to 70,000, 80,000 quite a lot of money it is a lot of money. that you have to part with but remember, just for you to look good. I always tell patients you pay for what you get. All right. Okay, well, unfortunately, this is all we have for you for our show today. We want to thank uh, Dr. Alistair McAlpine, Head of Medical Aesthetic and Light Scalp Aesthetic Clinic. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you for having me. All right.
Folk, again, join us next week on SABC News and please share your views and comments with us via our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. And remember, you can follow us on SABC Health Talk, Twitter at SABC Health Talk. And remember, this show is going to be repeated today at 2 o'clock and again on Thursday morning at 5 a.m. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Dr. Silo Goodbye and thank you for your tweets, by the way.